is and has made history because she was really South Africa's first talk show host. You know, people say Felicia Mabuza Sattel was the Oprah Winfrey of South Africa and that she started this whole genre and it was Great South Africans. And Felicia, a very warm welcome. You hosted a show called Great South Africans. You are considered a great South African. And yesterday you won the Shared Interest Ubuntu Award. So without being modest, I'd like you to share your acceptance speech so that our viewers can hear the beautiful speech you made around accepting this award and really what it meant for you. Well, can I duplicate that? But first and foremost, Nadia, I'm used to being on the other side of the camera. <laughs> so this is a little difficult for me, but thank you very much. And I'm honored because I have such high regard for you and the work you have done. Um, and nothing like being honored and appreciated by a peer in the business. Well, where do I start? So let's first start thanks to shared interest. Yeah. I really must say thanks to shared interest. And how aptly named was that award? Because I honestly and truly believe that Ubuntu is in my DNA. I don't know any relative that I have not helped or touched in any way or other. And I'm talking about immediate relatives, from taking them to school, from hiring them, from helping wherever they can, et cetera. Just today, I was talking to someone about having to share and how I share, let's just say $100 between all my relatives. We have an African expression that says, roughly put is, we are who we are through somebody else. Mm -hmm. And the other one being the children of the same mother literally share the head of a locust and we will all be satisfied after that. And that's just how I was brought up and I believe that to this day. And that's why I can still share a hundred dollars amongst all my relatives somehow or other, even if it's just a quarter you get or a dime, but it will be shared. So that in Shared Interest Award meant the world to me. I accepted it on behalf of the young girls and boys of Soweto, where I grew up. In fact, of all the townships, I used to stand at that gate as a young girl growing up, daydreaming and just hoping for something somehow, some magical moment where I possibly will become somebody one day. So to those young girls and boys, I say, never give up on your dream. No one and nothing should stop you from realizing your dream. Look at me. I somehow managed to do it. How did I do it? I'm still not sure, but I know that I used to admire people like Marina Maponya when I see her on the billboard, when I see her driving to a business, and I'd say, one day I'm going to be on that billboard, one day I'm going to drive like them. I used to admire Miriam Makeba, saying, one day I'm going to sing like Miriam Makeba. I'm going to have my name up at the Apollo Theater. Yes, my name went up on the Apollo Theater marquee, but I was not singing. I was interviewing the likes of Mayor Dinkins, Harry Belafonte, a congressman, is it, um, for, if, Not John Rattles, Lewis. Rattles, I think that was his yeah. name. But anyway, it was, those are, those are some of the memories I have and shared interest really brought them back to life again. So here I am. Felicia, I think people don't fully always understand again that you, you were born in South Africa you grew up in Soweto yourself, which for people who are watching, it is a black township, historically yeah. black township in South Africa. And fast forward, you moved to the States and Nelson Mandela, now there's a picture of you and Nelson Mandela. I know you were great friends and he had enormous respect for you. So bring us back to him making a call to South Africans to return. Tell us about that and your relationship and how you in fact came back to South Africa? Well, at that time, I was working at City Hall as communications director. In the US? In, in Atlanta, yeah. 
And we were negotiating the Olympics at that time. I was part of the delegation that went to Barcelona to watch the last Olympics there and hopefully to bring them to Atlanta. Then came the moment with Nelson Mandela coming to America and making that call to all South Africans living abroad. I remember I was asked to come in a co-anchor that time or, or not really co-anchor, but maybe to be a, what do you call them? What do you call a spokesperson for South Africa at that point to talk about uh, South Africa and talk about Nelson Mandela's journey and Winnie Mandela at that time. And I was, but when he made that call to South Africans to come back home, I remember coming back and watching it again with my family and saying, he's talking to me. I would love to go back home and go and assist in whatever little way I can in bringing about communication among black and white South Africans, hoping to eradicate fear amongst us. We had lived apart for over 40 years in fear of each other. And this time I felt through communications, through dining and dancing together, we will be able to understand each other more and eliminate those eliminate those fears. So then in ninety two, I did yeah. Then ninety two, I went back to South Africa, met with uh, Mr. Mandela. I think it was around March. We had dinner at his house and we talked. And I said, I'm coming back home. November, I went back home, and November eleventh, I think, I went November second, but on November eleventh. There I was on air doing the first show, and it was all about South Africans coming back home. On that show was Mrs. Adelaide Tambo, um, Reverend Chikani, et cetera. But we started talking about the, the audience was made up of many South Africans who had lived abroad, who had come back, listened to Mandela's plea to South Africans to come back home to serve. The rest is history, really. So interesting because people look at us, Felicia, you and I, and, and South Africa. Really, Mandela became president in 1994. He was only released from prison in 1990. Mm -hmm. We look at this and go, isn't it remarkable? South Africa is a full democracy. But you lived during apartheid segregation for those Americans who are watching. You then left South Africa during the apartheid years. You come back and we have a democratically elected government for the first time, mm -hmm. and you live through bringing people together. Now, and just tell me how comfortable you are answering this question, because we haven't discussed before, but we are now living in America where there is so much divisiveness. And I thought here you and I are sitting having a conversation. What, I mean, what thoughts during this period have you had towards you are now in Atlantic Georgia? I know you still refer to South Africa as home, but you know, what do you say to Americans who are divided? A country where one could say, you know, racism and a feeling of separation is certainly not a thing of the past. I am somewhat looking at America right now with a lot of pain. As I mentioned to you when we were talking over the phone, I'm fearful when I go out at times. I know I have all these beautiful videos of me showing me walking comfortably and singing down the streets when I'm taking my walk, etc. cetera. Um, but each time I see a police van go by, my heart literally stops for a second. But luckily in the bag that I'm carrying, my water bag is my ID, this brings back memories of the past laws in South Africa, is my water bottle, my phone, hopefully to capture any moment that I'm not comfortable with or that I see. Um, I, wrote about, I wrote about this one time on Twitter and I was saddened to see a response, a very coarse response from the white South African who attacked me, did not understand what I am going through living here and told me to go back to my black hole in Africa, in South Africa. She left the black hole and came to America, hopefully for the same thing that I came to America for. I'm not sure what she came for, but well, I came for an education. Right? No, I came for an education. 
That's what I had come for. Nelson Mandela had said to us, arm yourself with the most powerful tool. What was that powerful tool for me? It was my education. So I got my education. And yes, I'm married to an American. I have American children. I'm living here. My body is here, but my heart is in South Africa. That is why if you follow me on social media, you'll see that at least 90% of what I post is related or connected with South Africa. Last night, after watching the awards, the Shared Interest Awards, I quickly turned on to another channel, NBC, and watched my children, I call them, from the Nlovu Choir. Oh, yes, you singing and dancing on America's Got Talent. You should hear my, my little video to them that I sent back. I just was shouting, Abandona <laughs> which means my children, my children. And uh, there they were showing the beauty of South Africa. You can call South Africa everything you want, but beautiful. It definitely is the most beautiful country in the world. Now, I the Indian Global around. Choir was here. That's you right. Surprised them. On I flew all the way. I flew all the way to. I, yeah, I flew all the way to LA to go and spend a few days with them. For me, young people like those children remind me of my days, when in the seventies, when I used to have a. Um, a dance school, I used to call it Zolo Billy Dance School. And I used to teach young people, conscientize, as Steve Biko used to say, conscientize the youth. So I was conscientizing the youth by making them dance the cha cha cha, the rumba, not to the usual songs that they used to dancing them to, but to songs like Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, or Nina Simone's to be young, gifted, and black. Um, so those are the songs I was using. And they were getting conscientized. They did understand what we were doing. On Sundays, the older uh, people, young people, would come to my house and would read the books that were banned. I'd give them lectures about self-pride, etc. Monday, we go back to the dance school. We dance, even if the police stopped by, they did not quite understand why we were all gathered there. They thought we were dancing. They were not listening to the lyrics of the music we were dancing to. And it was all aimed at what Steve Biko taught us, always conscientize the youth, let them fight the struggle. And I'm not saying my youth, but youth in general in Soweto in 1976 literally li liberated us. And, you know, Felicia, for people who are watching this and, and you, you have such a history and such a story to tell, and we're going to get to your books in a moment, but remind everybody who Steve Biko was and why he was so important in South African history. I think, um, quickly explained, he really kept the struggle alive after Nelson Mandela was in jail. I, I call him the second Nelson Mandela and Nelson Mandela in his own right. He, the civil rights movement, et cetera, all are things that sensitized us to understanding how to possibly fight um, apartheid in many ways. So that's who he was. And he was brutally murdered. Yeah, brutally murdered in, in jail. And- By the um, police. Mm -hmm. You know, we forget, I mean, talking to you, and I think this is something, and I've had so many interesting conversations with fascinating people, but one looks at you and, you know, we see this very accomplished, remarkable woman has been lauded. And one of my friends once said to me, one looks at you and goes, you couldn't possibly have experienced any prejudice. Mm -hmm. And he said, you wouldn't believe the prejudice I have experienced. And part of the dialogue we're having in America right now is just because somebody is of a certain socioeconomic status and just because they are accomplished doesn't mean they still don't experience prejudice. Mm. And I think that's something we all have to look at and try and educate ourselves around. And I think as a Black woman, you experience it in the boardroom, in the streets, even at home sometimes. Uh, 
going back again to my taking a walk. I was coming back from a walk mm -hmm. and this black woman, black executive woman driving a Mercedes Benz stops and says to me as she drives into the yard, oh, I said, oh, I was taking a walk and Rebecca, I just got so scared again. I saw the police, but I always hop and dance so they can see I'm not scared of them, but I'm scared to death. She said, yes, because I was followed into the complex. We live in a gated community. Mm -hmm. And blue light came on as I came in. And he wanted to stop to me and said, why are you going in, in there? And she said, I live here. And she says, can I see your driver's license? So even when you're driving into your own suburban uh, home, ho yeah, home, you are being stopped. And I know that uh, there's this whole deal about wanting to get suburban housewives. I am one, <laughs> and I think possibly differently from somebody else, etc. So suburban homes have now been integrated in many ways. We live with each other. Mm -hmm. We're fearless of each other. We love each other. So I'm not quite sure what is happening in America, but it does bring back memories of the old South Africa that I grew up in. It brings back memories of being born in Sophia Town and growing up there, seeing men, black men being handcuffed together walking for hours and hours with that, looking for other black men who don't live in those supposed areas where they're not supposed to be living, which were called then or designated white areas. We were moved out of Sophia Town. To this day, I still have images of those trucks moving people with their belongings out and standing at a gate watching them with my little sisters. I'm not sure what's happening to America. This is not the America that I was, I thought I was aspiring to come to. I said to a friend in South Africa, when are you coming to America? He said, you know what? I'll see the whole world before I see America again. I've had that's why I think it's so important that we, we continue to dialogue, that we continue that's to true. have conversations. I'm actually um, talking to uh, a woman tomorrow who's written a book, by the way, Felicia, you'll find this interesting. She's written a book called Five Things a White Person Should Never Say to a Black Person. Oh, that could and, be interesting too. Be interesting. You should start off with don't touch my hair. <laughs> it actually starts off with don't say I don't see color, which was interesting. Anyway, uh -huh. I mean, what or I have say? black friends. Or I have black friends. Please no, no. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we say in South Africa, when somebody says, uh, anyway, I'm, I'm curious to hear what she has to say, but what I'm, you know, books like White Fragility and Warmth of Other Sons and just helping educate us all so we can create a different environment and a different dialogue. So shifting slightly, because there's so much I want to talk to you about, and we actually need um, several days, not <laughs> live, because there's so much wisdom. And I think, again, it's, your children grew up mainly in America with visits to South Africa. So mm -hmm. while you shared some of your experiences as a child, you know, do they relate to what you went through? And so many South Africans, we call it the born free, these people who were born post-apartheid, mm -hmm. they don't fully relate to what their parents went through or endured. Is there ever a disconnect? Are your children curious? I'm going to say yes and no. Yes, in the sense that one is definitely a rebel with a cause. I mean, she is an activist, born activist. The other one is one who just loves peace and calm as best as possible. But as you know, both of my children are married to, one is married to a Danish guy and the other one is married to a, a German guy. So... In that sense, I think they're also trying to educate their partners about who they really are as, as black women and how to see them as black, strong women. And you have two very strong, talented daughters. Felicia, shifting slightly, and by the way, I also have a German son-in-law, so we have a lot in common, and it's always interesting embracing other cultures, dealing with what is a sense of sameness and other and how we overcome mm -hmm. any biases that we have. 
because innately there are things that we do to look at people and see them as human beings and go beyond perception, go beyond mm -hmm. stereotypes. Mm -hmm. but your two books, so you spoke about uh, dare to dream and then live to dream. So with all your vast experience and struggle, and there has been enormous struggle to get to where you're at and to be the accomplished person that you are, and I think that's one of the universal truths that we don't get to a point of receiving awards and acclaim without going through a lot of pain and difficulty. Mm -hmm. So share the books with us and how you are working with companies and individuals to inspire them to overcome the challenges. Wow. You know, when I grow up, Nadia, I want to interview like you do. You're very good. <laughs> oh my gosh, Felicia. Well, I grew up watching you as a role model. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I'm just trying to cover a lot of material in a very short amount of time. I know. But uh, my first book, Dare to Dream, really, is based really on my story coming. It, it's not an autobiography or biography. It is really just my journey growing up in the township and having these dreams to one day become somebody. And it's written aimed at inspiring young people in the township to really not give up in spite of what they're going through. So I felt if I tell the story from this little girl with her knock knees with ashy little legs, little legs who wanted to be somebody, and they see me as as also demonstrated in the pictures, then they too realize that it is possible. And that is why I love the Nlovu Choir, because those children remind me of me growing up in Soweto, wanting to sing and singing like at Mrs. Mutsielo's uh, singing group. I used to want to dance. Yes, I became a ballroom, ballroom dancer. I used to want to be on billboards. I got myself on billboard somehow, became the first black face for Lux soap. Remember Lux? Did you use oh, Lux? And then you were on <laughs> Destiny magazine. I think you've got your Destiny cover behind you. Yeah, possibly so. And uh, <laughs> yes. yeah, that's it. That's true. But, uh, and even behind me, I also, I always, people that I admire or that I've also possibly interviewed. And I always say, get to, to those young people, I'll say, get close to people that you admire, talk to them, shake hands with them. I know we cannot shake hands anymore, <laughs> but okay, elbow them and get to know their story because if you can get that close, you too will become somebody because it eliminates some type of fear. So getting close to them matters. Yes, I got close to Oprah in the eighties. I went to watch her speak and uh, she was still not that big at that time. And I said, one day I want to be like you. I want to do what you are doing. And I did. I saw Phil Donner, you doing his show. I knew that that's really an African concept. I'm going to do bring people together to also talk. We call it Lakota in South Africa. We call it an Indaba. So bring black and whites to come and create an Indaba. And then my second book, is really about inspiring young people. And that's where my, this quote comes from that I just came up with that says, no one and nothing should stop you from realizing the, your dream. It's not just for youth, it is for anybody sure. who, who wants to really feel inspired. And the inspiration obviously came from living with an inspiring husband yes. who, who inspires others. So that's how that book came about and it's Live Your Dream. And I'm living my dream. <laughs> I am living on, on what I call, people say, are you retired? Are you on retirement? No, I'm not on retirement. I'm on preferment. I, I do love that. only what I prefer to do. And that's why I'm with you right now. That's a Felicia-ism. There are a few Felicia-isms. People <laughs> always ask her, because I've seen Felicia socially, and people are always intrigued by how good her skin looks. So is it the lux, Felicia? Because you often get asked that. Well, it's oil of delay. <laughs> I haven't heard that one. Oh, yes, I love okay. delay. Okay, I mean, what other secrets can you share? Um, the other thing people don't know about you, Felicia, is Felicia loves children. 
And any child oh, who my gosh. adopts as a child, but she also loves to cook. So during COVID-19 and lockdown, have you been cooking? Too much. Lord, I'm so tired. I'm tired of cooking. Um, as we speak right now, I'm trying to figure out what am I cooking tonight? And, and my husband know. always says, I don't know how you do it, but you whip up things that I have never even yes. thought of. There are lots of sides to you. You know, as I've got to know you over the years, and of course, grew up in South Africa watching you and Felicia, you know, very iconic as this person who created a whole genre of television and met these people. But then there's this real earth mother side that I think so many people don't see because you're very glamorous. Felicia. Oh, in fact, you know, I hear the kids bouncing balls down outside there and they're, going, they're playing basketball. When I'm done with you, I'm taking this off, putting my tennis shoes on and going to put, put my mask on and go and join them yeah, shooting so some hoop. Well, there's so much to talk about and, and I really wanted to have a chance to talk to you both. Just congratulations on the award. Thank you. The Ubuntu Award for shared interest. And I think you explained that so beautifully, but also just that we're all living in this very unprecedented time in our lives, not only COVID-19, but amidst, and both Felicia and I live in Atlanta, amidst an atmosphere where there is a sense of divisiveness. Mm -hmm. There's a sense of animosity toward anybody who doesn't believe what you believe. And just to have this conversation and say, and you said it brilliantly, which is get to know someone else's story. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, we, we know we should, it doesn't mean we always do. So an honor and a pleasure and a privilege. And just tell us again, the two books, Dare to Dream and Live Your Dream. Everything's available on Amazon, I assume. Yes, that's right. Dare to Dream and Live Your Dream. And um, But I'm homesick and I'm also longing to see my grandbaby. I call him my glam baby because I'm not a grandma. I'm a glamma. Oil of delay, glamma, and living in performance. And the other thing is, Felicia, you are available to do virtual keynotes. You know, if people want you to talk to their groups or their people or their individuals just about overcoming adversity and believing in yourself which that's is right. the cornerstone of all success that's it's right you know something Maya Angelou said and it's just so beautiful a, a quote I recently posted around you know you can't look back at your life and yeah. regret what you didn't know mm -hmm. and I thought all these true quotes that just help us understand that here you are if you look at your life and what you have achieved through the struggle through education through living through apartheid and here you are, and saying to people, whatever your struggle is right now, easier said than done, but trying to find a way around it is what I think we all need to do. I'm finding the serenity prayer really being very helpful at this time. I, When I'm taking my walks as well, I'm praying the serenity prayer because this is beyond us. There's nothing we can do about it. We just pray the experts are making the right decision. So uh, the other one is the prayer of Jabez. Let us learn to be thankful. I'm thankful for what I have, a roof over my head, most importantly. And um, mm -hmm. being able to share when I can, that makes me feel grateful. In fact, someone said, what makes you happy? I said, it's not going to buy an Escada blouse or a Chanel bag. It is truly, if I can share the little bit I have with somebody, I have such good feelings after that. Mm -hmm. And I know you have shared with many, 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 many people. And I love that that's the prayer of Shabazz. And I'll say one line of the serenity prayer and you'll say the next because it is helpful, which is God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. And then it is the change the things that I can and the wisdom to know the difference, right? Amen. So what a pleasure and a privilege. And Fish, I really hope I do get to see you in person soon. Let's do it, girl. As okay. soon as uh, they say the restrictions have been lifted, I'll be out there. Right now, I'm staying in, within these walls. The visa that I have right now allows me to go to the kitchen, to the bedroom, to the bathroom, <laughs> and that's it. Oh, Felicia, that's a good one. Okay, so yes, what a, I mean, listen, we have to find the humor. I mean, it is there's there's humor to be had as we acknowledge that this is just a very, very strange time in all of our lives. Yeah, okay, Nadia, thanks a million. Thank you so, thanks so again. much. Thank you are amazing. Author, award winner, talk show host, 
lovely person, great cook, exemplary glam ma and friend. Thank you so I've much. I've paid Nadia to say all those things, people. Thank you. Say <laughs> love to the family and Earl especially. Thank so you.